these funny glasses because I had eye surgery. Say a prayer for my eyes, please. Uh, one of them's doing well, the other one's not doing too well, so your prayers will, are appreciated. Also pray for the Donahue family. Richard lost his wife, Janine, uh, last week. I was able to anoint her, and Father Sony was as well, but they've been parishioners here for something like 70, 80 years, and really pillars of the parish. So pray for Janine's soul and for uh, Richard, who is now a widower, and the family. Well, today we have part four of five parts of John chapter six, so we're getting towards the end of this five-part series that we've been covering over the last four Sundays from the great Eucharistic chapter of John's Gospel, chapter six. Today, he says four times, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. He says, unless you eat, using the Greek word trogo, not estio, estio is kind of the common word for to eat. Trogo is more graphic, meaning to feed on, to chew, whereas he could have used the verb estio, meaning like more like just eat in a generic way or to receive or consume, but he wants to be very clear, and that's why he says it four times. You have to take me, my body, into your body if you want to live forever. Now, the Jewish understanding of body or flesh wasn't just meat, as we think of it today, but the whole person. The Jewish people of the time were rather more earthy and less virtual than us. The body was very important and sacred for the Jewish people, and still, still are, and for us Catholics as well. Our religion is built on the flesh, the flesh of Christ, the body of Christ. But not just the flesh. The body, blood, soul, and divinity is what the Eucharist is. The whole person of God. Really? You've heard that phrase many times, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. But how, how many of us really understand? I was a college student in 1980 at Penn State in one of the dorm rooms. My roommate was Protestant. We had been friends in high school. And a knock on the door one night announced a lay minister from Campus Crusade for Christ, a Protestant organization that does really good work in bringing Christ to college campuses. But he came into my room and, oh, here, Billy is Protestant, Joe is Catholic. Oh, Joe's Catholic. Well, you believe that the Eucharist, that host at Mass, is the flesh of Christ. And I said, we don't believe that, that's crazy. Now, I had gone through catechism, 12 years, CCD, Mass every Sunday, and I know my mother and father told me that, but I didn't believe it because I didn't understand it. And it was a campus crusade Protestant minister that taught me the reality of the Eucharist. He said, that's what you're supposed to believe, Joe. And so I started to believe it. I did a little research. And the Eucharist is the whole person of Christ not just his body and blood, but his soul and divinity. In other words, you and I receive divinity into ourselves at the Holy Mass. Divinity into mortality. And unless we do, we die. Only God lives forever, and only those who have God in themselves are capable of living forever. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, you do not have life within you because I am life itself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Receiving life itself into us, we live forever. This happened, of course, 200 
2,024 years ago in the incarnation at Bethlehem, when eternity stepped into time, when the infinite God enclosed himself within a young woman's womb, an organ the size of my fist, the infinite God who made the universe lowered himself, became the smallest. The eternal word became a speechless infant. The almighty creator became the weakest and most helpless of his creatures. That's the mystery, the glory of the incarnation. The infinite condescension and humility of God towards his creatures. This is what happened 20, uh, 2024 years ago. It's what happens today in 2024 AD. This is what happens at this mass and which we will receive. John Paul II wrote many encyclicals, 14 I think. His last one, however, his last will and testament, so to speak, to the church was on the Holy Eucharist. His encyclical Ecclesia de Eucharistia of written on Holy Thursday or, or promulgated Holy Thursday 2003. And the title of that encyclical, this great Pope's description of the Eucharist is Ecclesia, Church. Ecclesia de Eucharistia, the Church of the Eucharist, the Church built on the Holy Mass, without which Without the Eucharist, there is no Catholic Church. As John Paul II says, she draws her life from Christ in the Eucharist. So the first two or three words of an encyclical set the tone for the entire document and really encapsulate, summarize the message of these encyclicals. What, what are the first three words? Ecclesia de Eucharistia, the church of the Eucharist. No church without the Eucharist. I want to read from you his first words. The translation, the church draws her life from the Eucharist. In Latin, Ecclesia de Eucharistia, meaning the church draws her, uh, her life of or from the Eucharist. Let me read it, the, the first part of this paragraph. The church draws her life from the Eucharist. This truth does not simply express a daily experience of faith, but recapitulates the heart of the mystery of the church. In a variety of ways, she joyfully experiences the constant fulfillment of the promise, lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. But in the Holy Eucharist, through the changing of bread and wine into the body and blood of the Lord, she rejoices in this presence with unique intensity. Our Lord promised at the end of Matthew's gospel, just before he ascended into heaven, that he would be with us always to the end of the age. How? Through the Eucharist. We don't have to lament the fact that we didn't know Jesus personally because we do every time we receive him in the Holy Eucharist. We don't have to miss the Lord with an emptiness that he has left us abandoned on planet Earth and returned to heaven because he hasn't. Not only has he sent his Holy Spirit, but he has left us the sacrament of his presence in the Holy Eucharist. I am with you always until the end of the world. And so we rejoice with a unique intensity, the, the Pope says, at his presence in the Holy Eucharist. It's the center, the source and summit of all the church's power, of her joy, of her spiritual riches. Paragraph 20 of this document goes on about the problems of our time. Now remember, he's writing this in 2003, not too long after 2001, where the world changed. And many younger people don't remember what happened on September 11th. I don't, weren't there. I had just finished uh, my morning prayers and was heading to mass on September 11th, 2001. 
and people were freaking out that um, New York and Washington had been attacked, the trade towers were falling. I, 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 I said, there must be some mistake here, that's impossible. And really that was a watershed, it was a turning point in our, in our world history. We've entered, in some sense, a darker, less secure, more frightening time. And two years after this, John Paul is writing this encyclical on the Eucharist. He says, many problems darken the horizon of our time. We need think but of the urgent need to work for peace, to base relationships between peoples on solid premises of justice and solidarity, and to defend human life from conception to its natural end. And what should we say of the thousand inconsistencies of a globalized world where the weakest, the most powerless, and the poorest appear to have so little hope? It is in this world that Christian hope must shine forth. For this reason, too, the Lord wished to remain with us in the Eucharist, making his presence in meal and sacrifice the promise of a humanity renewed by his love. In other words, as dark as it gets, as chaotic and unsafe as the world becomes, the church's job is to proclaim hope, that God is with us, and he is with us primarily in the Holy Eucharist. Lo, I am with you. If we know that he is with us until the end of the age, we are not afraid. Nothing can disturb our peace and our joy if we go to Mass. Why are we so unpeaceful and afraid as a culture? Because so many have stopped going to Mass to re receiving the Eucharist. If you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life within you. You are fearful. You are dead men and women walking. Finally, I want to finish with the Pope's own conclusion about Our Lady. Our Lady is the mother of the Eucharist, and of course, this parish, Star of the Sea, is a church, a parish of Our Lady. So number 55, blessed is she who believed, Elizabeth said to Our Lady at the visitation. Mary also anticipated in the mystery of the incarnation, the church's Eucharistic faith. When at the visitation she bore in her womb the word made flesh, she became in some way a tabernacle, the first tabernacle in history, in which the Son of God, still invisible to our human gaze, allowed himself to be adored by Elizabeth, radiating his light, as it were, through the eyes and voice of Mary. And is not the enraptured gaze of Mary as she contemplated the face of the newborn Christ and cradled him in her arms, that unparalleled model of love which should inspire us every time we receive Eucharistic communion? When Our Lady said yes to the angel, let it be done to me, in Hebrew, that is amen, amen, let it be so. And that is what we say when we receive the Holy Eucharist. The body of Christ, amen. Let it be done to me as you have said. And we become immaculate at that moment. We receive the immaculate heart of Our Lady, purified by the burning ardor of her Son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.